Good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the second session of this uh, webinar series. Uh, this is Erica Poda speaking, and I am an instructor with the RSET program. And today we have a guest speaker. Her name is Karen Yuen, and she is the uh, science and applications lead for OCO2. And she will be doing a demo on how to access and filter and visualize OCO2 and OCO3 data. So with that, Karen, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Ewan and I am from the OCO2 and OCO3 team. I'm the Science Data Applications Lead, and I will be talking to you today about how to access and visualize both the OCO2 and OCO3 data. And um, I will be uh, talking for the part two of a four-part series, so this agenda should look familiar to you all. And I will be helping you with the learning objective, the third one, which is to be able to open and visualize um, the XCO2 data product from OCO2 and OCO3. The overview of what I'm doing today uh, is here. So I will be summarizing some of the characteristics from the missions, the measurement approach, the spatial and temporal resolution. A lot of this should be a bit of a review after uh, Dr. Vivian Payne's presentation, but I will do a quick overview and then delve into showing you some steps on how to download our data, our, how to na our naming convention for our products, uh, showing you some of the document documentation, and then jumping into the live demonstration portion with the Jupyter Notebooks Jupyter Notebook and some of the other animations that we're able to do from the code that we will be presenting today. So just a reminder for folks, we are looking at uh, data from OCO2 and OCO3. These two missions are NASA's dedicated missions to looking at atmospheric carbon dioxide from space. OCO2 was launched back in 2014. And so we have uh, almost an eight year record because it was launched back in July of 2014. So we have a fairly substantial record ongoing, almost 10 years. And OCO3, which is the sister instrument, it's the same flight instrument, but mounted on the International Space Station. And that has been on the space station since 2019. So just an overview again, the measurement approach for OCO2 and OCO3 are similar, but they give different results. OCO2 is a free flyer. It is on a satellite in orbit and we get global measurements and we have fairly small footprints in the size of about 10 kilometers. And with OCO3, you will see since it flies on ISS, we don't cover the poles, we get 52 degrees north-south latitude in the measurement, but what we get in exchange of not getting the poles, we get much more uh, precise and denser footprints over those areas in the latitude. And in addition to that, we do have the mapping capability on OCO3. And once again, for folks, um, we are looking at the XCO2 product from OCO2 and OCO3. Essentially, XCO2 is the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide that's present in the column during the time of acquisition. And we do many acquisitions throughout the day, and that's how we get um, basically all the, the measurements. And um, we know this from the spectra, that we collect because OCO2 and OCO3 have a spectrometer. And um, from the spectra, uh, from the instrument, we're able to derive our values of uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide. 
The spatial resolution for OCO2 and OCO3 are a little bit different um, just because of how the instrument is mounted. We have about a 10.3 uh, kilometer footprint for OCO2 and we have a 16.4 kilometer footprint for OCO3. So we're in a very exciting time right now because since the launch of OCO3, we have both missions flying at the same time. And that allows the science team to be able to actually look at both data sets together. And I bring this up because for folks who are interested in looking at our data, it's great to look at the OCO2 data for the longer time trend. But if you're looking for more data points and values over certain areas, uh, specifically at 52 degrees north and south latitude, you'll be get a lot. You'll be able to get a lot more data points with OCO3, and it is. Um, it would be very useful to actually look at both data sets together. So now we're going to jump into the the a big part of the presentation. Where do we download the data? I would recommend two locations. The first link that we have there is the uh, Goddard DAC. That's where the official, the NASA official OCO2, OCO3 products are archived. We suggest that you go there. But then another location for you to ex explore data sets would be at the co2.jpl.nasa.gov site. That one, you actually will be able to pull um, carbon dioxide data from other missions as well. So it's a nice place to be able to look at other data products from other missions that's related to carbon dioxide. And I wanted to spend a little time showing you this because I know the naming convention can seem a bit foreign, but we will be going back to this again and again. And it's just, uh, this is a reminder for folks to look at how these files are named. And there's actually a, a logical explanation behind that, even though it seems funny. And you can see that anytime you look at our data products, and this would apply for um, almost any NASA data product, it lists the mission. It will tell you what kind of uh, product it is. In our case, it's a light product. So you see the abbreviation for it. When it was, uh, when the product was put together, the build, meaning that there are different um, times that this was produced and the versions, that's all noted because that's good for reference. And of course, we always end with the data format. Today, we will be looking only at the light products. OCO2 and OCO3 product comes in full physics and light products. The full physics just gives you a lot more variables that you want to look at for the scientists who want to be able to look at as many variables as they can and want to. But for folks who really just want to look at, for example, I want to know the values for CO2, then I would definitely go for the light files because there are less variables. And um, basically, they just strip some of the, the variables away to make it a light file. And it's also a much smaller data file for you to download. All our data files our light data files are in the NetCDF4 format. And if you really want to delve in to understand um, more information about the data products, I highly recommend that you go to the link there to look at our ATPD. And then there's also a link for the user guide to read more information about the data products. And when you do go into the DAC, into the archive, there are also um, active links to take you to these, uh, to the PDFs of, of these documents if you need to reference it. Okay, so we're gonna get started. And um, like I said, the, uh, the primary location we send people to get our data products is the Goddard DAC. And that is, the, it's the official um, archive for all of our OCO2 and OCO3 data products. Um, you do need to register for a profile. It's absolutely free. You need your email and um, because that's where they will communicate information to you and also send you any updates if there are any concerns or any changes. Um, if we do new data versions, um, they also send out emails to the folks 
So that's a great way to stay on top of what is happening with those CO2 and no CO3 data products. And um, you are able to browse uh, any of the products uh, without having a login. But if you want to download the files, you do need a login. So I just wanted to point that out. And uh, to show you as an example, just to start out once you get there, uh, it's as simple as just typing in OCO2 or OCO3 in the search bar in there, hit browse data by category, and it will pull up a familiar page. Um, that was the screen capture from earlier. You automatically get a fairly extensive list of products and it may seem overwhelming and that's why we do these screen grabs so you know that you're not seeing anything that's unusual. But our most popular products are the ones that are on top and that's the one that's highlighted in red and that is it happens to be the one that we're working with which is the light file and uh let's see next okay from there oh forgive me if you uh if you look within the scare uh in the square there in the red square we actually ask you to click on subset subset slash get data and um, it will take you to the next screen. But I do want to point out that you can always check things. Um, you'll note from the very top, it tells you what the source is. So that's the mission, which version you're working with. And if you look at the, uh, the second data product, it says the nine retrospective. That's the previous version that is still available. Um, but the latest one is the 10. So that's the one that's on top. And um, these products are generated uh, every 16 days. You have your spatial resolution, and then you also have the begin date, which essentially is how long we've had, we've been uh, gen generating the data products. And the process level is that it's a level two product. So that's all listed on the top for you to follow. And if you click on the subset slash get data um, link, you will get this screen. And this is to get us started to basically start uh, whittling down the data files that we want to extract. And as you can see from the get go, we have a fairly large uh, data set and it's at 147 gigabytes. It's a lot. We're not expecting everybody to download that unless you're interested in that. Um, but the first place for you to start reducing the number of files that you would actually need is to actually look at the years, <clears throat> excuse me, the years that you will need. So you can refine by date range. And if you look into the right hand side, you see that I actually picked January of 2017 to January 2018. And so for a one year data record, it greatly reduces the um, the data files by one and a half times. And then um, you can further refine what you want to look at. And you can see we can refine by region, format. And let me show you some screens, screen grabs of those. And you get this just so you know, um, when you look at the download method, when you're in the selector, you can either get original files or the subset, meaning that you're reducing the um, the number of files that you get. So that's where you pick the time range and you would also need to refine the region. And there is a subsetting tool in the DAC that allows you to basically draw a box around the area that you want to look at and it can be a small or as big as you want it to be. It's just a reminder for the files that um, because of the very small footprint of OCO2 uh, data files, if you're downloading just a single data file, you may only get one or two passes over the areas that you are looking for. And the next thing you would want to do after that, after defining the time frame and the region, we're going to look at the variables that you'd want to look at. And the variables, you get a, a listing of all the variables and those are the ones with the little boxes on the side. Today, we're only looking at the XCO2 products. So you'd only be checking the XCO2 box. And then um, if you also notice that uh, 
the, the areas will light up um, and allow you to reset. If you make a mistake, you can always go back and start again. If it's grayed out like that, it means that you um, don't get to pick it. So that simplifies things very easily. And then after you pick all that, oh, and you only have one data format because with the light files, you only get the NetCDF uh, products. And then you would hit get data. And you'll pull up something that uh, looks like this. And you can confirm that the results that you have, um, how many files you have, you actually have the links there, they're individual links. And it tells you that you have results from January 2017 to January 2018. And, um, and you can see the uh, file name convention that was mentioned earlier that shows you that you're looking at OCO2, light CO2 product. It is the build 10 and the years that um, that we have, the date, I'm sorry, of the products in the net CDF4 pro, um, format. And as you can see, you can always, for reference, you have the links for the user guide, the ATPD, and the README document to work with the data products. You see from the top, you also get instructions for downloading, um, depending on how you want to download the files. And you can also download the files as text files. Um, and that would make the files a lot smaller, especially in a situation like this, when it's year long, you may want to download it as a text file to, to work with it. And we will uh, show an example of that a little bit later. So in order to do the demonstration today, to go through how we would be um, accessing the data after you download it um, and, and working with it, we highly recommend that you work in uh, uh, Anaconda or Conda. Um, we found that it is literally the most efficient way for you to work with our data in an open source environment um, because it has the libraries uh, already built in that is easy for you to work with. It, and it, it works in all the systems, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. And there is a link in, in there that we've posted that allows you to uh, basically install it onto your system and, and work with it. We are working in Python 3, so everything we've shown is in Python 3. If you're still working in Python 2, uh, uh, I recommend that you upgrade to Python 3 just because of um, uh, most of our data products and the code that we're presenting is working in Python 3. So it just simplified things tremendously. And uh, and like I said, working in Conda, you will have the libraries that we will be using today built in. If you choose not to download Conda and you want to work from the terminal, you can do that and just install Jupyter Notebook. And we have some links in there for you if you prefer to just download Jupyter and install the libraries individually. Uh, this is one way to do it for folks because Conda does, um, it, it's fairly large package, so it does take up some space. So if you're uh, space constrained, this is an alternate way for you to do things. And then the asterisk is to please remember which directory you download your files. The, uh, the code that we're presenting today, we do reference always back to where you would read your data files. So it's just a good um, common practice to create a folder where you download the data and um, any of the OCO2, OCO3 data, and you always have a common path that you can uh, orient, your, orient yourself back in the code to be able to read everything correctly. So these are just some screen grabs for folks. Um, if you're not working uh, directly in Conda, um, just as a suggestion for you and how you want to uh, get the information. You do need to do a pip install of the following libraries that are needed. And um, we did a screen grab so you can reference. Um, if you're not familiar working with it, you actually have a screen, screen grab to follow along uh, for the libraries that we would like you to install. Even though this is shown in um, an Anaconda shell, uh, you could do the exact same thing for uh, any terminal that you open, for example, um, in, in your Linux or your macOS system. 
And um, so you have two screens for you to kind of see and um, just as a reference point for those who are unfamiliar with that. And I also did a screen grab from Terminal that just as an example that when you download Conda, you actually see um, a lot more libraries that are available to you. Um, and that's why it takes up so much space, but it's, it's a much uh, easier package to work with if there are other things that you want to explore uh, visually and for analysis with our data. And then the final step, of course, is to run Jupyter Notebook. So all you need to do is essentially type in Jupyter Notebook. And once you type that in, um, in the shell or in the terminal, it will open up the notebook in a browser for you. And it would look like a blank page like we have in there that has the opening line. And at this point, I am going to trans uh, transfer over to the live demo portion. Okay, so for folks who are hopefully opened up a Jupyter Notebook, you'll be able to uh, follow along. Um, I did my best to make sure we have as many notes as possible for you to follow what we're doing. Some of this should look familiar. As you can see, we actually have what was in the PowerPoint portion, and now we're in the demo portion. This is a reminder of what you need to do to set up the Jupyter Notebook with the links that you need. All of this um, uh, are available in the repository of um, our GitHub, and that will be made available to you. And today, um, I'm going to show you, once we open up the notebook, this is where we are right now, I wanted to show folks that we're working with a single file example for right now, um, and then I'll transition over to the multi-file example. So first thing we're going to do is set up the environment for us to work. Once the environment is set up, it actually is repeated, and so everything can be built upon um, what was done before. And then I have several examples to show you as far as how you would be able to show the OCO2 or OCO3 data. And um, um, we're going to do some simple XY plots. And what we're able to show when they're multi-files, and then we're also going to show the data over um, some global maps. So let me launch into this. And for those who open up your, um, your uh, Jupyter Notebook, what's nice about this is that um, since we make this available and I'm doing this as a demonstration, you literally just need to copy and paste this over to your line, making sure you set up your directory, your directory, if you recall the path to read the actual data files, you just need that as a reference. Once you do that, everything else should run and you'd be able to um, plot and do some very simple basic visualizations right away. So the first thing we need to do obviously is to import the libraries. Those are in the system, but you do need to set up that you're importing everything. And then with Jupyter Notebook, um, I'm going to run line by line. This is the run up here. I'm going to run line by line. You do have the option of running everything at once but I'm just gonna take some time to um, go line by line. And um, just very quickly, we're working with NetCDF4 files. We're using X-Array as um, how we will set up the data uh, so that we'll be able to be read in a way because we're gonna be pulling um, just the data that we need. Um, we'll use um, NumPy and Panda we plot with matplotlib, plotly, and also basemap. Those are what you will use as the libraries to essentially uh, visually show your data. And then later on, if you would like to, even though this is not gonna be in the actual demonstration, we give you the option if you need to do it for, um, you need to put on a website, you can actually show the, the display, and that will also be in the repository if that's what you want to show at a later time. But today, we're only going to focus on um, plotting the data and showing it 
for the single file for the moment. So you do this and you do a run. And one thing you should know that when you're working in Jupyter Notebook, when everything is done right, it will literally go to the next line like it just did. If you have any errors, it would show up in between. And um, don't panic, it's, it's normal. Um, it runs sequentially and um, you just need to make sure, you know, did I have a spelling mistake? Did I list all the paths correctly? It, it really will guide you step by step on how to run this. And this is also the reason that I'm doing this run line by line. So the next line, and this is just a reminder if you need to check where your directory is for your data. Um, this is a very simple way to just check your directory and mine just shows you where I have put um, the data files. So um, that is a reminder to yourself if you forgot where you put it, that you, you run this to basically double check that you indeed have your data files in there because uh, that's what you need to reference. And that's very important when we get to this line because this is when we start defining um, what we're reading with the, the data files. So at this point, we are naming our data XCO2. We're looking at our NetCDF4 data sets. This is the single file that we're looking at. And this should be very common. This is gonna change depending on the machine that you're running on. It could be very fast, it could be slower. Um, it's just listed to let you know that if you have a faster machine, it'll be it, it'll be very fast. And you know, if you're on a laptop, it might run a little bit slower, but it's not the end of the world. And um, so it read the NetCDF uh, file, which is good. So you're proceeding now, and we're going to start looking at what's inside each of these files. And, and basically, you're telling you're going to list everything that's that's in the single file, and the output that you get are all the variables that are within this file. And um, I think there, I forgot the exact number for how many, but we have a, a lot more variables in the full physics for the light files. This is what you would get. And there are some key things in here that obviously we are looking for, like the date, the latitude, the longitude. This is what we're looking for that we need and the XCO2. What we do next is we make sure that we set it up in a way so that we can um, plot it and visualize it. And then we use X-Array to organize our data. And so we set it up in X-Array here. So we would run our file. So it's able to be uh, plotted neatly. And then we define the variables that we need. And this basically gives you a table um, uh, of how everything is set up. And I'm not going to open all of this. I mean, this can be expanded. It shows you all the other variables that you need. So everything is in here. It's just to show you we have the files, but we're only reading uh, what we need. And now you've set up your environment and we're going to get ready to do some very basic ways to show the data. So the first thing we're going to start with is Plotly. And um, just for folks, it does require a, um, to put things on a map, it does require a token. But um, we already obtained this token and we're able to share it fairly universally for, uh, for this to work. So it, it just works. So you don't have to go get it. But if you want to generate your own key, that, that's fine also. You just need to have an account to set it up to do that. And um, so the first thing we're going to do is basically take um, that single file that we've been talking about, and we are going to set it up so be ready to plot everything. And we show the variation by color. And so we're going to now set it up to make sure that we can read this correctly. And basically, we wanted to show the, the max min for the XCO2. And what we have found is that we actually have a maximum at 448 parts per million and then 343 
uh, parts per million as the minimum. So you know those are the um, those are the maximum and minimums that we have. And then from from the data files, and then we're going to start putting everything into columns and frames that we'll be able to then plot. And everything is referenced, as I said earlier, you have, you're looking at the XCO2, date and time, latitude, longitude, and we are looking at the XCO2 product um, with the quality flag of, uh, of zero, because that's the, the good product that we're looking at. If you recall from Vivian's presentation, we have quality flags of zeros or ones, and you can pick to choose, have all of the um, products, or you can just pick the good points as you wish. And, and this just basically shows you from the column of what we can plot. It gives you the count that we have um, 19, just a little over 19,000 um, data values for that single file. Um, the mean, uh, minimum, maximum, the name of it as being XCO2. This is just a reminder of what, what you're looking at. And then if you run this, you with Plotly, what you're able to show is a nice little plot like this. Now, since we have every single value that's in this data file, you see that we had the min, and then we have the max here. But the majority of the data values fall within the lines between the green and the red here. And this is where it's useful to say, let's just focus on where we have the majority of the values to look at what's going on. And that's where it's useful to actually do some filtering because um, it eliminates some of the files that you may wanna, uh, not some files, I'm sorry, the values that are just outliers that you don't want to look at. And you're able to actually, for this part, for the plotting, you can actually pick your minimum and maximum that you'd want to distinguish. So when you run this part here, you can actually enter the upper bound. And let's say we don't, we're not interested in looking at uh, 443 that they had up there. We're going to focus at like 415. We're just going to say 415 right now. And then we're going to look at just everything above 400 parts per million. And so that would be your new minimum. And once you define that part, that actually gets reflected in the rest of um, which data values will actually be read through um, the code. And if you run this, give it a few seconds. It's going to generate a new map. Ta-da! And you'll be able to see for this one single file, everything that all the values that are between 400 and 415 uh, for the single file. And it is, um, this is what OCO2 sees um, globally for that particular day. Now, from this, you might say, okay, I really want to just look at a smaller area. That's where you do further subsetting and you would want to look at it, maybe um, the, the latitude and longitude of the areas that you would like to look at. And what you do here is that we actually, we're gonna start with just something in the Southern hemisphere. Um, we're gonna look at Australia and you actually wanted to designate the latitude and longitude, you specify that and so you can actually put values in so you can enter the coordinates. And we know these are the coordinates that we will use for Australia. So this should look familiar. You're looking at the same thing again for your XCO2. Um, it's, this is the variable, date and time, latitude, longitude, your quality flag. And then this is the extra line that we've added that allows you to basically designate the latitude and the longitude that you would want to look at. And by the way, the minimum and maximum that we had set earlier at 400 to 415 parts per million, that gets translated into this part. So whenever you're interested in expanding that area, you can always go back to that line to adjust 
your minimum and maximum as you want to. And so we're going to run this. And once we've set this up, I'd like to point out that the display map style is in stamen watercolor. It's a pretty way to show it. In this particular library, you have other map box styles that you can choose from. We will show two examples today. So we have the stamen watercolor for Australia. This line that we have in here, as we have said before, you get to put in your actual coordinates that you want to run. And when you run in, so we show this example of um, Australia with the two passes like this. We also show the example of uh, California, and this is the lat long. So once again, um, we are subsetting. And as you can see from here, all we're just changing are the coordinates in comparison. Okay, but we are showing a different um, map. If you recall, this one is the stamen watercolor. And now we're going to show an example what it looks like if you choose a different map. And we chose dark map. And when you run it, you get um, the pass that we have nearest to California. And um, you can zoom in to look. And this is something that's interesting that I'm going to show you that that's interesting in Plotly that we show. Within Plotly, you can actually see the individual footprints that make up, um, I'm sorry, the individual parallelograms that um, make up the footprint. And these are all the footprints of um, from OCO2. And as you can see, each of these gives you, along this footprint, it gives you the average value and the latitude and, and longitude of um, acquisitions. So within Plotly, um, you are able to zoom in and get these individual points like this that gives you the values and the lat long if you're interested in looking at that. And that's really interesting because if you want to look at something specific, for example, over terrain or over certain areas where you would expect um, uh, elevated values or lower values, this is a great way for you to be able to zoom in and actually see this. Okay, and now we're going to go to BaseMap. BaseMap is just another package for you to be able to um, uh, visualize the data. And it, it's really by um, preference. So what I was showing you before with Plotly, it's, um, it's a little bit more pixelated, if you will, but you still get the information you need, but you're able to zoom in and see the granularity that might be of interest. Uh, BaseMap actually gives you the OCO2 or OCO3 data over a pretty map. And it just looks nice if you want to do a still or something like this. Once again, we have instructions in here for folks who choose not to use Conda um, and you just want to individually download the packages that you want, um, the libraries that you want. I'm um, sorry, the base map package, package and library. And so um, we have the instructions here for you to follow if um, that's what you choose to do. But if you use Conda, um, we actually have base map loaded. And um, what we do is all you have to do is you, you copy this over and run the code. And then show this. Give it a few seconds. And it will plot the data for you for the single data file. And it will actually um, show you over a nice uh, blue marble map. So this is just for a single day file to show you. And we also have an example to show you with the OCO3 data. Um, this looks, this is a nice way to show the OCO3 data because of the latitudes. So um, you basically take that data 
uh, the code that we have exactly the same way. The only thing you're changing is which data set you are reading. And basically, if you save your, your data files in the same directory, you're just changing out and saying, hey, instead of OCO2, we have a three here, same naming file convention. It's just you substitute the two and the three and you pull the file or you read the file. And that sets up your environment. This should look familiar. We set it up in X-Array again, so we can pull up and uh, set everything up so that we'd be able to run this. And give it a few seconds. Now you see the same map as above, but we're showing it with the OCO3 data. And you can see that um, it's it looks very different. The, the, the curves that you see there actually reflects how ISS flies versus this sort of convention for um, OCO2. So it just gives you, so you can see that you get more of the poles here and, um, and it's, more, it's straighter than you would get for um, when, when it's plotted flat like this, it's straighter. And you have these many um, uh, data values for a single data file. And then with OCO3, we have a bit more. And so this is a, these are what we could do for plots for a, uh, a single data file. And so what do we need to do for uh, multiple files? Well, this is great to start out and I highly recommend you actually playing around with this code just to work with the single um, single data files uh, first to get used to this and understanding the code and working with it because there's one additional step if you wanna work with multiple files. The way we do things here would make it very um, tedious to read uh, for multiple files, so we actually have another way that we do this, and I'm going to show that to you. Okay, so this is another example of the code to show you how to read um, using base map again, and um, showing you how to work with multiple files. And if you recall, we have the option of downloading the files as NetCDF um, or as a text file. Um, just for the size, we really recommend that you uh, download uh, in CSV. Um, we have a separate code for if you want to convert the NetCDF uh, to uh, CSV, I can make that code available for folks to look through. But just for the sake of time, and for your ease, you can actually download those files directly as CSV values if you're not interested in working with the NetCDF. And um, so this is just another way for you to work with our data and the values and plot it directly this way through CSV. And so some of this should look very familiar to folks. You know, we're importing the libraries that we had talked about before. And um, we have, uh, and Seaborn is just another way to basically represent um, the data. So, and what we're doing is that this particular code generates um, the 16 day cycle for, for each of the months. And as you can see, it's a little bit more, uh, it's, it, it's more involved, but like we have um, put together for you, when you put this in, um, and I can make this available on Jupyter uh, Notebook, um, some of these files are rather big. When you run it, you just, just need to give it some time when you're working with multiple uh, data sets, I'm sorry, multiple uh, months or years of data set. And just for the sake of time here, I'm going through the code to show you that we're using base map we set up the library and all of this is basically to help you define how things are gonna look visually, okay? A lot of this should look familiar. Once again, we're looking at longitude, latitude, the XCO2. And, um, oh, this is the projection for the map 
of how it would show up. And that just gives you an idea. We've already defined the latitude and longitude. All of that is just to set everything up to show up on the map as we need to. Um, this is the labeling. This is something that you can obviously customize as you want to. I mean, if you really wanted to, you can call it blah, blah, blah here if you want. But we are looking at XCO2 in PPM, parts per million, uh, the font size that you want to choose. And, um, and then you can also be able to pick and play around with this, you know, how you want the background to look, uh, or I'm sorry, the borders, the backgrounds, you would run all of that. And that basically sets up how you would show um, the actual data files over certain months. What is different from the single file is that we have one additional step and you'd be using the Dask library. So you would need to import that. And that's just an easier way for you to be able to set this up for the uh, for the visualization. And it's easier to, because it's for CSV files, but also for um, multiple files. And, but this should look kind of familiar to you that, you know, we're just looking at only the, the variables that we need. Once again, XCO2, latitude, longitude, um, the, the quality flag was picked, um, date and time, right here. So we're looking at the same variables all the time, but now we're gonna be able to set it up for uh, uh, multiple files uh, over the course of time. And um, just to reduce the size, uh, you can, you, you round it. So if you recall, we were looking at data that said, you know, 443.0 something. If you round it up, it actually simplifies things uh, significantly because you're dropping off the values that you may not need. And then um, always remember the path where you have your data. And basically, this is the portion that reads all the data files that you have. And once again, you just copy and paste this into your Jupyter notebook for when you run this. And you can do a simple test if you need to for a cycle just to, to do that. And then these below areas gives you the different ways that you'd be able to generate what you want to look at. You can either do it in a GIF format to show the frames, or you can output it as an MP4 file. And I'm gonna show you some examples of what it looks like when we do the multiple files. So I'm just going back to show, if you recall when we did the, the XY plot from before where we had all the data values, this was an interesting uh, way that was uh, shown by actually our intern Sagar Lim, Limbu who um, put together uh, the, a lot of the code for this. Um, what he found that was interesting is that there's a lot of value in showing, even in a simple plot and uh, in the uh, map plot lib, when we use that, just the variation over time. And he arbitrarily set a, a line at 419 parts per million just to see um, where the points are. So if we look at the values uh, in 2017, you can see that back in 2017, and this is, by the way, for looking at all the values over time over Mauna Loa. And what we were able to see even back in 2017 that the majority of the points were below 419 parts per million. And as you can see with time over time from 2018, 2019 to 2020, how all the data values have been moving up over time. And we thought that was just a very nice, easy way to show how that has moved up over time. And another way that we can plot, so these are just single um, plots that's just stacked this way to show you, but we can also show you this. Now, this is what we did for data values um, over California. And this shows what happens over time when we plot this. And you can just see um, here we define 
the point at 410 parts per million and you see the line that goes across there and you can see where it starts and stops and you can just see the trend over time over California over the last um, let's see the six years from 2014 to 2020 how uh, it's just progressively climbed over time. You also see the up and down motions of the data values because it shows the seasonality that OCO2 and OCO3 data are able to show um, in the Northern Hemisphere, the values would actually be lower because when it greens up, it acts as a carbon sink. And so you see the pattern of the up and down, just of the variation, the seasonality over time. And also what's interesting here is that since we launched in July of 2014, you can see at this point that the values don't pick up um, in time frame until later on in the year. So this is just another way to be able to plot all the data together to show this as a GIF for, uh, format. But if you um, set it up, as we did um, when you're looking at multiple files, you start getting the density of data that you see with the um, just with over time. And this is for the entire month of January in 2019. So you can actually get maps like this. Um, this uh, like this is what we had done in um, Plotly. The Plotly example we have. Um, except for uh, the entire month of January, and you see how that fills in. And this shows you the difference between just one year to the next, 2019, 2020. Same scale, as you can see, from the 390 parts per million to 420. 2019, 2020. And then when you put it together, um, you can actually show, if you just do several months, you can actually start seeing the change and the increase over time. And you're able to create all of this with the code that we have uh, provided to you and you can adjust obviously um, the parts per million that you want to actually display as we said earlier you can change the maximum and the minimum that depends on you and um, you can also uh, show just the regional areas if you want to focus on that and this is an example with OCO3 data but um, if this is just to give you an example that you can take the same data values and um, if you run it in uh, other software that's low, it's more high resolution, you can get literally um, a cinema quality data product, I'm sorry, data animation. And this highlights very well just how differently ISS actually flies compared to um, a free-flying satellite. And you see that the instrument continues to pick up uh, variation over time. And you can see in the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, how it acts as a sink and then, and it's reverse in the Southern Hemisphere. And then now we've moved into the winter dates, how it kind of oscillates between the two. And we actually started looking at putting OCO2 and OCO3 data together, but it was uh, fairly hard to distinguish the fine, finer details. So I think it's great for a regional area if you want to look at values, but for animations thus far, it's a little bit messy, which is why um, we, we played with it, but it, it didn't turn out very well. So we chose not to give you that as an example this time. It's a great way to do it as a single screen for plotting. 
but not for um, the animation. And like I have mentioned before, for um, these are some of the references that's made available to, to you uh, to get the information that you need to get our data. Um, the official NASA archive is the Goddard DAC. There's a link there. Or if you want to look at our, um, you can get the OCO2 and OCO3 uh, XCO2 products at co2.jpl.nasa.gov. It also gives you access to some of the other missions that have the CO2 um, information and data. And uh, at co2.jpl.nasa.gov, you do have the option to directly download the data products as CSV files. And then um, all the information that I showed today um, is made available. It's, it's public access in GitHub and in Colab. So it's going to be really easy for you to, to set up in your Jupyter Notebook because uh, we set it up in a way that you would just need to copy and paste this information directly into your notebook and you should be able to just start right away and you're off and running uh, working with our data after you have uh, downloaded the data that you want. We'll also make some sample data sets available um, through our set so you'll be able to download from there to um, basically start um, just start out working with our data. And obviously, if you have any questions, this is my email address. Please feel free to, to reach out. Um, I'm happy to help out any way I can. And um, I'm always looking forward to how people want to use our data. And, um, and I also like feedback from people. They say, hey, why did you do something this way? Can you, have you thought about um, setting up uh, some uh, another way for us to look at the data and we will keep updating um, I plan on updating um, the github and the collab continuously so that folks would be able to find new ways to be able to work with and visualize our data and uh, so please go to the training webpage to, for more information and um, let's see uh, follow our set on Twitter and um, thank you for your time. Wonderful, thank you very much, uh, Karen, for that uh, presentation and demonstration. And so now we are gonna start our Q&A session. We've been gathering some of the questions that uh, you've been writing in the questions window and we have been putting them in a Google Doc, which we will share with you. Um, so please, um, if anyone has additional questions, please just write them in the questions box. And the document, uh, this document that you see now on your screen, we will be posting this document on our training page. Okay, so uh, let's start then uh, with the first question. Could you please explain how you downloaded the data? The last step after slide, slide 12, do you, do you just need to download the links to the data? Hi, yes, I'm, uh, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. Uh, yes, you have to download the data and uh, the, the, the links, basically, if you recall from the slide, there are instructions that you can uh, do a batch code, if you will, to download all of it um together and th this is the tricky part because our files are rather big so if you choose to download the data files you need to give it some time and that's why i didn't show it in real time because i would have it would have taken a lot of the, the time to do that um but yes those are the links and you can literally just download the files directly from there and uh it, yes I apologize if that wasn't clear. Okay, thank you. Question number two, I have Python with Anaconda. Will that be sufficient to run this or should it be installed as standalone? It, it should work as is. So you would literally um, open up your, your uh, prompt and uh, 
uh, at the line, you just type in Jupyter Notebook and it will literally open up a new notebook in your browser of choice, uh, it, whatever you have set it up to be. And you will have that open, just that one single line. And you would be able to just start copying the code that we've made available and start working. Okay, question number three. Can we display the map other than map using the map box key dependency? Well, to, to use the map that we chose to um, display the data, the, the the folks asked us, yeah, they 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 have the the dependency there. So that is that that's associated with that um, package. So yeah, you do need the the, the key depend uh, the, the key. There may be other packages where you won't need that, but that's what we chose to 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 work with. Um, I'm not sure for the question if they meant that they can try to use the data for another map or if they want to use it without the key because the, the short answer is yeah, you're, you're going to need the key to use that map. Okay, so maybe the person that wrote that question can clarify on the uh, on the chat box. Please, thanks. So let's move on to question number four. How do you compare the intraday time variations in satellite observations? So like one observation at 9 a.m. and another sometime later. Uh... I want to make sure I understand this question correctly, because if you're looking at just um, OCO2, the data is collected at about the same time. So we don't do any observations at 9 a.m. It's between, I think it's like 1, 1.30. And Vivian and, and Abhishek, please correct me. PM. Yep, 1.30 p.m. for OCO2. Yeah. And then for OCO3, that's going to be dependent on how ISS is flying. If you're asking the question about how we would collect, compare this, the OCO2, OCO3 data with another satellite, um, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Because when I'm you start comparing, go I'm ahead, sure. Go ahead. Oh, or Vivian, yeah, why don't you go ahead? And, and then I can answer the OCO3 perspective. I'll I'll let you say about OCO3 because I was going to say something about diurnal variation and CO2, but I'll let you I'll let you say. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so for OCO2, yes, as Karen mentioned, that the data is collected at this just one time, 1330 local. OCO3, which is flying on ISS, has a slightly different orbit, as we mentioned during the session. It has this two ISS ascending node, ISS descending node, and depending upon those orbits, you can you indeed end up collecting data at different times during the day. Um, sometimes, for example, like let's say we are looking at a place, uh, let's take the example of Los Angeles, we can be collecting data in the morning, and then you can be collecting data in the uh, afternoon as well. Now, what happens? Um, is that if, for example, we are trying to compare this data against a particular validation site or against some other site, then we typically try to look at what we call as this co-located data in space and time. So that means we make a specific bounding box around that size, uh, site in space and then also in time. So for example, we'll only look at data within plus minus two hours or um, like sometimes it's even less, like plus minus 30 minutes of when the satellite passed over that site. This helps us constrain the variations you can expect in XCO2 uh, over the day. And within that 30 minute or two hour period or in a particular site, we do not expect that large variations in XCO2. So we can get away by using those observations from different times. Um, now, what happens is that over the course of the day, starting from the morning and going up to the afternoon and the evening, there is a huge variation that happens in CO2 fluxes. 
right? And so CO2 fluxes is exchange of CO2 between the land surface and the atmosphere. And you can imagine during the day when plants start with the photosynthesis and other activities, there is like a huge uptake that happens. So there's a drawdown in CO2, and then later in the nighttime, there's a release. So the change in CO2 close to the surface is quite large. But again, because we are looking at that column, that magnitude of change gets dampened or diluted. You can still have a large variation. Um, so for example, over a forested site, if you're looking at a measurement during like, let's say June, July, August, which is the growing season, you can still end up with a change over the course of the day of almost like 2 ppm, which is significant. Um, but, and, and that's why we end up constraining the time, like if you're comparing it against other observations or against other uh, validation sites, we end up constraining the time period to a very plus minus 30 minutes or plus minus two hours. So then that uh, variation in XCO2 is pretty small. Um, Vivian, sorry, over to you. Well, I think you covered it really well, Habshik. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Question number five, are there web APIs to download the NetCD4 files programmatically? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't name one specifically. I'm sure there are ways to do it. Uh, that's a, I will have to test it to yeah. see which ones I would want to work with, but working with our our archive center the dac they like i said they have to you you can download by link or you can batch download things the other thing that we need to resolve just uh for clarity there is supposed to be a way that you can work with our data without having to download all of the files and they are actually troubleshooting that code right now we're we're working it real time with them and hopefully you'll be able to access our data and just pull what you need without having to download all of those files unfortunately that was not resolved before we did the the training but that is something that's being worked through the DAC and I'm hoping that once we have that we'll be able to let users know how they can do this without the, the owner's task of having to download all the files. Uh, there's also one library called PyDAP that allows us to like get access to our, our data website and get the data without actually downloading the file. Great, thank you very much. And for participants, um, just to let you know that online we have uh, Vivian Payne, she presented in the first session. Uh, we have Abhishek Shatterjee. He will be presenting the next session, number three. Um, and uh, the person that just spoke is Sagar Limbo. He is the um, person that has written most of the code that you saw today. So thank you um, to all of you for being here today and, and answering the questions. All right, so let's carry on then to question number six. Is there a way to convert or export NetCDF data as GeoTIFF for post-processing in GIS softwares? So, there, yes, there are ways to do it. We don't have an official way that we have put out yet for the OCO2 and OCO3 uh, data. That is also something else that we are working on both on our end, just to explore, but also the the Goddard DAC. Um, they actually, it, it's not official, meaning that they, they haven't put out an official code, but that is also being worked. The short answer is yes, there is a way. Um, we just haven't made it public. But for the person who had asked this question or the folks who are interested in that, please go ahead and reach out to me and I can uh, set you up so you can work with the folks to get access that way. 
Also, uh, I wanted to add on this one. Um, we did some testing with NetCDF files and converting to GOT file. And we did some, we did run some samples. Uh, so we can put up that code into this folder where we can, we can save with everyone. Thanks, Akon. Yeah. We're hoping to set it up in some official capacity because we're getting this question enough. We're, we're aware that, um, that folks are asking for this. So this is just one of the asks uh, that we have for the, the DAC to, to make that uh, available for users. Okay, question number seven. I've read that base map is being deprecated in favor of Cartopy, but Cartopy doesn't have all of the nice features that you demonstrated today. Are you planning on sticking with base map or switching over to Cartopy or some other module for your high resolution static maps? Uh, Sagar, I'm gonna put you on the spot because you chose that. Do you have a comment on that for the um, for this question? Yeah. Yes, yeah. so what we did was uh, we tested out like with different libraries, right? For visualization and we stick with the base map but we have been trying with uh, different libraries like PyDeck, Kepler, but in the future we might use other uh, libraries that are more like uh, similar to the base map or, or has more features. Uh, so the libraries that we have tested so far is PyDeck, PyDeck, PY, D D C A D E C K. Yep. Okay. And yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, Cigar. Question number eight: Is there a cloud native solution like cloud optimized geotiffs on the Stack App API with Microsoft Planetary Computer? If not, are you working toward a cloud solution? Ooh, I, I don't think we are, but I, um, to be honest, that's a management decision. I don't know. Uh, Vivian and Abhishek, I don't think we've talked about that. At least I have not heard anything. We have not talked about this. I mean, this is this is really great to get these kind of questions. It's something that we can look back into on the project and talk to the data center about. But um, nope, not right, not right now. Okay. Question number nine: Why does the data have gaps within tracks? Are there any ways to fill in the gaps? Uh, so. What's the best way to answer this? Uh, there, there are gaps in the track because of, of how, I, I, I imagine, in between the, the passes. Um, for the level two products that you see, those are the, the actual passes. We're not going to, because of the small footprint of the, the, of the instrument, uh, we're not covering every part. So the, of, of, of the earth, so you're going to see the spaces in between. You're also going to be hampered by, because we can't see through if there's um, clouds. So you'll see uh, that, that you won't have data in that area as well. So that, that, that's why you will see the, the gaps um, that way. Um, are there ways to fill in the gaps? Yes, uh, that's where you would have a higher level product, but I don't work with that. And I would appreciate if Vivian or Abishai could talk about that part as far as the filling in the gaps. <laughs> yes, happy to. And in fact, we will cover uh, very briefly about this higher order products in the next session. Uh, so I will specifically talk about what we call as a level three product, which is a gap-filled XCO2 estimate. 
there are different ways in which that product can be generated uh, through very simple statistical methods or through very advanced data assimilation methods. And uh, we will show some application of using that gap fill product for studying anomalies in CO2 concentrations. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you for that. Great. Um, next question, number 10. Is there a timestamp in the NetCDF4 Net files indicating the ingestion date, upload date, process date? Uh, for the nomenclature, we have the, the, the date that the product was acquired, and then you would have the, the version and when it was produced. But I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by ingestion date. Yeah, I think that question might refer to when that observation was made. Yeah, so that that information is in it's in there. Yes. Yeah. Great question number 11. Is there any quota on downloading NetCD4 CDF4 files? Is all the data freely available? No, there is no quota. And yes, the files are all freely available. And I'll just add to that that that's NASA data policy. Like all, all the NASA data products are freely available and no quotas. Okay, question number 12. Is it possible to obtain an XY plot with the data? Uh, yes, if I'm um, not sure if they, they missed out on part of the presentation. That was the first example that was done. And um, that, that's the most straightforward way and easy way. So yeah, it's, it's, in, it's in there. So the short answer is yes. Question number 13. Is it possible to export this data to GIS or to some other uh, vectorial program or software? Directly, no. You're going to have to convert the the file. Um, but we, yes, we you can do it because that's something we are exploring. And um, I didn't go into that part because for the sake of time, we just focus on the basics of how to start working with the data. Like the previous questions before, we are aware that a lot of the users are interested in being able to have the files, but ultimately to, to, to be able to apply it and export it to, to GIS. Uh, if whoever asked this question, if you wanna email me so I can understand a little bit better what you're looking for, I'll point you to what can be done very quickly. It's, it takes more steps, and um, and we may have something available to you already, but I just want to have a better understanding. Question number 14, what data is in the different product levels, level 1A, 2A, et cetera? Um, I don't think I'm the right person to answer well, I, that. I can take that one. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> so the data products we're talking about today were the level two light products and that's that's the lowest level that we would recommend for people to use the level one you know levels below the level two light level 1a is sort of raw spacecraft data level 1b is geolocated and calibrated radiances. Um, I don't anticipate this audience will want to use the level 1A or level 1B data. Um, go, go with the level 2 light products, which is the XCO2 information. Okay, question number 15. Can you do vectorial processing with any library for this?
I'm not sure. But, uh, we can always go back and uh, respond this later. Yes. Um, from what I understand from the question, I am not aware of any of the libraries that can do that directly right now, but I haven't explored it enough to be able to answer this with certainty right now. So I have to go, I have to check on this. Okay, question number 16. And I think this one is a clarification on a previous question. Another one, now this one, uh, another one related to QGIS or GIS. Mm -hmm. It says, I asked uh, the question on Mapbox key dependency. Mapbox acts as a base map. Can we export the data and plot and display the data uh, simply in QGIS with a base map? I think with QGIS, you have to create the layer. And right now, the way we have our data, it does not translate directly to the, the, the base layer that you need to put into Q, um, QGIS. So there are some additional steps involved. So the short answer right now is you can't do it directly, but there are steps that will take you there. And um, once again, I, I understand that there are a lot of users that want to have this and you want to have in a GeoTIFF format. You want to be able to directly take our data and have it in some sort of acceptable format that can be used in GIS and we are trying to uh, set that up. Can you do it? Yes, it just takes more steps, but we would like to get to the point where we can make um, like a GeoTIFF format product available and um, or if not, at least provide universally some directions for you to be able to do that. And that's being worked with the DAC. That's great. Question number 17. Are there any Python libraries specific to working with OCO? So for example, not matplotlib, but ones implemented by NASA or OSS that work directly with OCO and NetCDF NET 4 files? Um, Pan Panopoly? Okay, Panoply, yes. Yeah, sorry, I said it wrong, Panoply. Okay, so that's one option then to use Panoply to open the files, the NetCD, CDF4 files, and then export them. Question 18, any notable OSS projects related to OCO that you can recommend? Oof. <laughs> um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I have to come back to that because I, I look at what, in terms of what we could recommend and certainly what cigar has worked with for this particular task but as far as recommendation um i'm just cautious on how i answer this because i i'm i was we've looked at what makes the most sense to just do the task but as far as something that's specific that we say hey just I will have to come back to this question. Okay. Question number 20. Have you considered staging your data on a public ERDAP server? This would allow users to programmatically access data using consistent URLs. Uh, um. No, we haven't because our data is made available through uh, the DAC. And, and to be honest with you, it's uh, a lot of this, since we make the data freely available, there's also uh, cybersecurity issues 
that um, that change. And I, we really just respond to these requests because that years ago, you know, we had F FTP sites, but those all went away. So um, I apologize that that that's just there are security uh, protocols, and so we will not be staging the data that way. I can make some specific files available, but not access directly. Like I'm, I'm sure that the, the person who's asking the question is is asking for. I, I don't think that's going to change. Okay, and there's a one last question in the question box. Uh, can we? How can we do anomaly detection or deviation from long-term mean, like standardized Z-score? I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, we there are some yeah. examples of um, work that's in the literature where people have been doing anomaly detection. Maybe we can add some references to the Google Doc after the fact. That would be fantastic. Okay. Uh, so another question here coming in. Let me just can you provide data on OCO2 or OCO3 and monitoring data for each different country at different times? For example, for countries that have signed agreements at COP26. So I'm thinking this question is more focused on can you use the OCO2 and OCO3 data for specific countries? The answer is yes. And again, this is a piece that we will discuss at the next session. So the way we use the OCO2, OCO3 data is that we do not directly use the concentrations per se, but then we use the concentrations through an inverse modeling framework to estimate the net flux exchange that's happening between the surface and the atmosphere. We then bring in information about fossil fuel emissions, as well as information from other bottom-up inventories like movement of wood products, crop products, and other fluxes uh, exchange that happen. And we pull in all that information together to deliver what we call as a net carbon exchange or NCE. And that term, we can then sort of divide it up by country totals. And in fact, we are providing that information, those NCE estimates to the global stock take process. We recently had an RSET training on that global stock take. And so I think it would be uh great to put the link for that global stock take training materials here and so whoever asks this question can then take a look at those documents wonderful and it looks like i skipped the question number 19. can the oco2 data files be imported in google earth engine and if yes can you share any references for that uh can it be directly imported into, well, it has to be in some sort of layer form. So eventually, yes, but it takes a few steps. And um, can you share reference? I will have to write that up and make that available. Okay. But right now, if you open up our files in, I know if you do it in, in um, Panoply, I think with Panoply, it directly, works into Google Earth Engine. That is a more or less direct step. OK. Great, so I think, let me see. That seems to be the last question. So with that, um, we will end this session.
I just want to remind everyone that our next session is on Tuesday, May 31st, and Dr. Abhishek Chatterjee will be talking about measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide. Uh, sorry, he will be talking about uh, global and regional carbon cycle studies uh, using OCO2 and OCO3 data. Um, he is the project scientist for OCO3 and the deputy project scientist for OCO2. So please um, don't miss this is this presentation will be another great one. And the final presentation will be on Thursday, June 2nd. Uh, so we have two more to go within this webinar series. I'd like to thank all of the participants, and I would especially like to thank our guest speaker today, Karen Yuen, um, as well as uh, Vivian Payne, Abhishek Chatterjee, and Sagar Limbu uh, for answering all the questions. And um, I would like to thank the RSET uh, team, uh, Selwyn hudson Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, Sarah Kutschall, Brock Blevins. And with that, I wish everyone a great day. Before we close, uh, any final words from Karen? Uh, none, thank you. Well, none, what am I saying? Thank you for being here. And um, I know some folks have reached out to me directly already. Uh, you have my email. If you have questions, please reach out. I'm, I'm happy to, to work with anyone on this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you.